Good morning, everyone. It's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and we want to welcome those joining us online. We're so happy that we can be here together. Before we get started this morning, I just want to read a passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 8. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. This passage is so foundational to just the understanding of the relationship that Christ wants to have with us. Before the foundations of the world, he loved us and he just showed us this love that sets us apart, that he wants us to be his children, his sons, his daughters, to be part of his family, and he wants to do great works in and through us. It's so awesome to see how before everything, God intentionalized a relationship with his people, and he forgave our sins. He made a way for us where there was no way before, and he's just so worthy of all of our praise. As we join together this morning, can we stand and just prepare our hearts with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that above all, before the foundations of the world, you intentionalized your relationship with us. You chose to love us. You chose to put your all into a relationship with us, God. And we thank you that your love for us is deeper than any love that we've ever experienced. That you have grace for our shortcomings and for our failures. And that you made a way to forgive us of sin and wash us clean of all unrighteousness, that we can be in relationship with you, Lord, a relationship that is set apart, where you want to do great things, where you want to make us more than we would have ever been on our own. And Lord, we thank you that you saw us and you loved us enough to do all of that on our behalf. God, we are just so thankful for who you are and the relationship you want to have with us and for the grace that you pour out on us that we're undeserving of, but you lavish on us. God, we pray that in our relationship with you and our relationship with others that we would reflect that love and that grace and that goodness. And God, I pray that as we enter into this time of worship that we would remember these things and it would bring praise to our hearts, that we would come together prayfully and praise-filled to just pour out our hearts to you in song, in prayer, in worship this morning, and that you would do exactly what you want to do in this place. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, King. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Once you've added your offering, you can feel free to stand with us. We're going to continue to worship the Lord.
Okay, good to go. Um, did you ever have those times you felt like uh, God's just talking to you? Yep. <laughs> Haven't even made it to the message yet. It's real powerful. Go ahead, and, go ahead and preach, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> it's real powerful this morning whenever a pastor said people at the end of their life, they feel like they've missed something. They spent all this time. I could relate to that. I was 32 years old before I turned my life over to Christ. A good friend of mine said to me a few years ago, he said, I feel like I need to talk to God about what have I done in my life to direct people away from you? That's powerful. And I felt that. But here's the beautiful part. I took it to the cross and laid it there. And that's where it's at. Amen. And I thank the Lord for that. And I would say, even though 32 isn't that old, I can say that now, right? <laughs> It's never too late. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful for your indwelling in us. Fill us with your majesty, Lord. Lord, I pray this morning for those who have suffered loss. I think of Randy and Randy's family. I think of the Modzell family, for Greg. I think of Dorsey's family. Lord, may you give them a peace that is beyond any understanding. Only you can do that, Lord. We know that you can, we trust that you will. And we trust too, Lord, that these family members would receive it that they know it comes from you, that they would feel it. Your love endures all, Lord. Lord, I ask for your comfort in their lives. Lord, I ask that you would be with those people who are suffering this morning with physical ailment. May you heal their body, Lord. May you give them the strength. May you encourage them. Lord, may you be with those people that are around them, be with their family members, be with the health care folks that are caring for them. Lord, may it be abundantly clear where that hope and that strength and that comfort comes from. Lord, I think of those people who are suffering in other ways this morning, may it be mentally or financially or in relationships. Lord, may you be there. May they see you working and be encouraged. Lord, you give us things to celebrate. Thank you, Lord, for giving us joy and peace in our life. Lord, we celebrate with Brandon and Deanna. Thank you for their service to you. May you guide them. May you direct them in their future. I ask that you be with their family. May you give them understanding and strength and confidence and peace and all those in abundance. Lord, I thank you for those people who serve here in this, in this building, in this community. May you be with those who are, are teaching adults and teens and children and toddlers and infants. Thank you for them, Lord. Thank you for providing them to this church and this community. Lord, may we be the light on the hill. May you use us, Lord, in our community, in our workplace, in our families. And again, make it abundantly clear who we are serving, who we are worshiping. Lord, we praise you in all things. We praise you in the high things. We praise you in the low things. Lord, give us confidence as we go about this world. Lord, I ask you, you would be with us this morning. 
that our minds would be able to comprehend what you have in your message, that our hearts would be open to receive it. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Eric. At this time, the children are dismissed. If they'd like to go to Children's Church, they're welcome to do so. So we'll see you guys later. Have a great morning. <laughs> you know, Brandon uh, feels like he owes me something, and it's not a debt of gratitude. It's some kind of revenge thing, I think. I, uh, he asked me how to dress, and it really depends. How did you dress for your ordination interview, uh, Reverend uh, Smeal? Do you remember? Suit and tie. Suit and tie. But when Brandon came in, there were other guys there for interviews, and none of them even had a tie as far as I can remember. And there was Brian. I told him suit and tie. And he feels like I, I tricked him. I will trick him, but that wasn't one of the tricks. <laughs> but if someday I come up here and my shoes are tied together, it's probably Brandon that did it. You know, he owes me in his mind. Pardon me? Maybe not. Maybe it's you that owe me. Come on. <laughs> Did I tell you suit and tie? I don't remember. I don't remember. Hey, I'm so glad you're here today. I'm so glad we can look into God's word today. And uh, I hope this prepares us for next week as, as Bobby uh, will be available in the 10 o'clock service. I mentioned that, right? Yeah. If you'd like to, I'd encourage you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 24. There is a Bible app event for this message, and you can follow along that way. If you would like to, Deuteronomy chapter 24, we're going to spend some time there. I'm going to make some other verses we're going to be talking about. I'll make them available on the screen, kind of like this one. This verse is actually our key verse this morning, and it's going to be our key verse for the next few years. Listen as I read it. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, this kind of Bible verse, if you attended Sunday school as a child growing up, you probably memorized it. If your kids are attending Sunday school, they're probably going to memorize this verse. It'll be something they'll pick up and carry with them for the rest of their life. It is a great passage of Scripture, fantastic words. I mean, what would our world be like if we took this to heart? What would our nation be like? What would the, the media, both the news media and the entertainment media, what if they lived by this as a code? What if, what if our political system worked this way? What if our, what if our church family did? What if, what if your family family did? What if you did? Act justly. That means to set aside your... your <laughs> poor treatment of others and to treat people with fairness, to treat them right, to do what is just. Love, mercy. <laughs> that means you feel so much better about forgiving someone than you would feel if you chose to get even with them. Walk humbly with your God. That means to set aside the selfishness that you have and humbly give attention to what God has in mind for this world and for you. It is simply an excellent passage of Scripture. I know what we need to do. Let's order some pens and have that verse printed on it, and then we can just put those places. Let's do that. That's a great idea. Or wait a minute. Here's another idea. Why don't we make a song out of this verse? Let's just make a song. I think Maranatha did that in the 80s. That's a good idea. Let's do it again. Or wait, I know <laughs> this is it. Whatever social media you have, let's put that on our social media. Let's make this go viral, right? Wow. Sometimes that's the way we think about something that is profound and important. We, we almost treat it in ways that are just too easy. Let's like it. Let's share it. That's too easy, you know. Loving this verse means actually doing this verse. Loving this verse and living this verse are two different things, and really the difference is in the details. It's easy to make pious proclamations, and 
and to talk about what's the right thing to do, but it's easy to say that and then just forget it and walk away. God doesn't do that. God indeed does make proclamations about what is right and what is wrong. And then he shows us and lives it and demonstrates it by his actions and by his very nature. When this verse says to act justly, what it means is to do the right thing. I really don't feel like going ahead and going to visit that shut-in today. I got so many other things. Do the right thing, Steve. You know, I could probably get a sermon online and just preach that. People seem to like other people's sermons better than mine anyway. (laughs) I think I'll do that. Do the right thing, Steve. I really don't feel like going to lead that small group this week. Do the right thing, Steve. That's what it means when it says to act justly, and it is always do the right thing in in reference to other people. I didn't know that. In fact, I I had a very one-dimensional view of the word just, justly, justice, until I read a book that my son-in-law gave me by Tim Keller called Generous justice. You see, until I'd read that book, if I talked to you about the justice of God, I pretty much meant the punishment of God. Like, he's going he's gonna to take care of that. It's a great right throne. There'll be judgment there, and justice will be meted out. But biblically, justice is a lot more than that. When you give the farmer the money that is right for the 12 eggs that he's just handed you, You're paying what they're worth. You're acting in justice. And when that farmer looks through those eggs and makes sure none of them are crushed or cracked even and hands them to you, he's doing what is right. He is acting with justice because justice is treating people fairly, treating people right. And the difference between treating people poorly and treating people fairly, the really, the difference is in the details. If you want to see some of the details and your Bible's open to Deuteronomy 24, you'll see them as we talk about these verses. Deuteronomy 24 is kind of an interesting passage of scripture because we seem to come upon a group of, of laws because the Deuteronomy is the second book of the law. Leviticus is, means the law. Deuteronomy means the law again. And and we seem to come upon these laws that are very detailed about specific situations in relationships. And they have to do, the commandments have to do with justice, doing the right thing. And one of the things you're going to notice is that acting in justice does mean tending to the details and not just making some kind of a pious statement. This past week, our teens went to the youth retreat at uh, Beulah Beach. It's called Breakaway group of our teens were gone last weekend for that. And Milton, one of our youth leaders, came back and he was talking on Thursday night about something the speaker said. The speaker said something like this. He said, you can't just buy a sandwich at Chick-fil-A and feel like you've done justice. You can't just buy a sandwich at Chick-fil-A and feel like you're making a difference. And he's right. You can't just like something on social media or share something on social media and feel like you're all done. You, You did your justice for the day. That's not real justice, because real justice is in the details. And tending to the details means, means desiring that the lives of others be full, that their lives be overflowing with goodness. My cup runneth over. There are people who feel like being a Christ follower is all about the things that you're not supposed to do. Well, you know, Christians, they're not supposed to do this or that or the other thing. Okay, yeah. Christians aren't supposed to cheat. They're not supposed to gossip. They're not supposed to sleep around. They're not supposed to commit adultery. They're not supposed to steal. They're not supposed to lie. But none of us are supposed to do those things. None of us are supposed to do those things. Even though the Christian life involves self-denial, the Christian life is not primarily about what you're not 
supposed to do. The life that Jesus offers is one where you live life to the full. I probably share this verse with you. It might be in my top 10 verses that I share with you regularly. It, 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 <laughs> to share it regularly is doing justice to the verse. How about that? It's John 10.10. 10. When Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and they might have it to the full. The King James said they might have it more abundantly. Now that doesn't mean that Christians never have trials and never have a shortfall. Jesus says we'll have tribulations. It doesn't mean if you're having life to the full that, well, God wants you rich and you should have this, that, and the other thing. That false teaching of God wants you rich, it just won't die even though it smells like death. Abundant living happens when you recognize the things that you have in your life and you receive in your life are coming from the hand of God. And their value increases immeasurably when you recognize that these come from God. It's kind of like a gift from a human being. You know, maybe someone would give you an automobile as a gift. How cool would that be, right? What do you want? Do you want that Dodge Challenger? That would be great. You want the Tesla? Boo, hiss, that would be bad. You want that F-350? Yeah, that would be awesome, just so I have that card to fill it up with too, right? If someone gave you that kind of gift, that would be really cool. But your grandma, who loves you, and knows that you're going to study architecture in school, buys you a Pentel mechanical pencil and says, here, this is a gift for you as you go to school. And it breaks in the first semester, but it's still in your drawer because it was given to you by someone who loved you. And, and the truck doesn't make your cup runneth over, but the gift from your gram, that has value. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, following me makes your cup runneth over it. it. The abundant life happens when you receive the good things you receive in life as gifts from God because it changes everything about living when you see that. You see that God wants you, that he wants you to live a life that's full in Deuteronomy 24. Being newly married, that's a good thing, right? That newlywed stage, mine has lasted 40 years so far. So far, after this morning with the birthday thing, yeah. Um, look at verse five for a minute and, and see the peculiar thing that God says here. If a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. Oh God, you are so good. How beautiful is that, right? And when God lays this out, he is acting in justice. I mean, all of us have heard stories, watched movies, maybe somebody even experienced personally getting married and there you are, you're newlyweds and suddenly you're called up for active duty and you're going overseas. It happens all the time. And when that happens, we all think to ourselves, man, that is just a shame. That's not right. That's just not right that that happened. And so God, when he is teaching us about justice, he requires that the people in that era see to it that the newlyweds enjoy the pleasure of being newly wed because justice desires to see the lives of others overflow with goodness. I never thought about that. I never would have thought about that. But God thought about it because for God, the difference is in the details. Another detail of justice is seeing that others are receiving respect I didn't say the respect they deserve. Did you notice that? Let me ask you a question. Is respect earned or is it bestowed? Both. When I was younger, I used to say to my parents, when I'd say, you're not, te you're not treating that teacher with respect, Steve, I would say, ah, that teacher's got to earn the respect. I was wrong. 
Respect is indeed earned. There are certain people I respect greatly because of what I've seen them do and what I have seen in them. There are other people I respect simply because they are made in the image of God and that reality demands that I show them respect. Yeah. So doing justly means showing respect because it's the right thing to do, Steve. This honor issue is made clear in verse 10. Take a look at it with me. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house and get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge out to you. You understand what a pledge is. It is kind of collateral that you would hold while you loan them something else, right? You see what God's talking about here. He's talking about honor, respect. I can almost hear the lender. Ah, <laughs> I see you've fallen upon some hard times and what'd you say, you need to borrow my oxen. That'll be fine, but I'm gonna need some collateral. Do you mind if I go through your garage here? Yeah, there's not a lot here that I'm interested in. What about that shed out back? Oh, that's your outhouse. Yeah, I'm not interested. Let's go into your kitchen, your living room. Let's go into your home and look, what do I want here? Let me take a walk through here and see if I can pick a pledge that would be something helpful to me. Can you imagine how humiliating that would be? It's a slap in the face to the borrower. It's a violation of space for the lender. He's stealing their honor. He's not acting in justice. Acting in justice, it assures, ensures that you preserve the honor of others. And the difference, it's in the details. Another detail of justice is making sure that others have the basic necessities of life. Remember, a pledge is what you give them as collateral. In some cases, in this day, it would have been a cloak. And if you know history, you know, until just maybe 150 years ago or even less, most people just had one coat, you know? Laurel and I lived in a church, a church. Laurel and I lived in a home that uh, was probably built, what would you say, in the 30s, honey, probably. And uh, if you remember when we moved in there, there was no closet downstairs. And, and the upstairs closets, the two of us wouldn't fit inside them. Not that we ever tried to, <laughs> but they were very small. And we had to build closets there because the people in that day, they only had two or three outfits that they wore and just one coat and they could hang that on a peg when they came in the door. So it was in the days that Deuteronomy, the days of Moses, So verse 12 says this, if your neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. Then they will thank you and hear this line, and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. It gets cold at night, especially if you have homes without heat. And I'm pretty sure that there wasn't some kind of a Lennox heat pump that was in the uh, poor person's house in the book of Deuteronomy. So if I borrow something from you in that age and I give you my coat as a pledge, do you know it would be really swell? If you brought it down around before sunset so that I could keep warm for the night, you can pick it up in the morning. And apparently if you don't do that, you're being unjust, at least in the eyes of God. God looks to our basic necessities. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. It's just part of acting justly. It's a detail that you might not have considered, but the difference is in the details. Here's a fourth. Another detail involves, uh, that justice involves is treating others with fairness. Treating others with fairness, especially when they've fallen on hard times or in a bad place. I'm gonna read verses 17 through 22. That's about five or six verses. Um, Just follow along as I read. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice. Do not take the cloak of a widow as a pledge. Now listen to verse 18. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command this. When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat olives from your trees, 
Don't go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. And when you harvest your grapes in the vineyard, don't go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. And then look at verse 22. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. This is why I command you to do this. You know, when he's talking to them about justice, he's asking them to act with a little bit of compassion. In all these verses, God is telling us to think about others, to give thought to their lives, even the details, especially the details. It was almost a lifetime ago that a vice president of the United States said these words. I'm not going to tell you who he is because if you're Republican and he's Democrat, you're not gonna listen. If you're Democrat and he's Republican, you're not gonna listen. So just listen to the words, okay? Just listen to the words. The moral test, and by the way, this isn't about the government. This is about you and me. Listen to what he says. The moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. <laughs> Regardless of your political persuasion, you know deep in your soul that those words are true, not just for a government, for a nation, for a media outlet, for a workplace, for a church, for a family, for you and me personally. It's easy to memorize Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's really a great verse and it's important it, it might feel impressive to speak with elegance and say something like, a citizen, I'm sorry, a civilization is measured by the way it treats its weakest members. <laughs> yeah, those are good things. But how do we live that out? I think maybe living it out involves attending to those details. It's acting with justice. Now, I told you we were going to look at Deuteronomy 24 a lot, and then I had other verses that I put on the screen. One of them is Deuteronomy 10, 17. It is in the Bible app event. 17 and 18 say, For the Lord your God is God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Now look at the screen. It says, <laughs> He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. So to live this out, I want to defend the weak. I want to love them. And when I see the weak, the fatherless, the widow, the alien, I want to care for them and defend them. This is what God does. I want to be godly. So watch him, imitate him. In Psalm 10, verse 14, you see God helping those who have no help, and he's acting with justice. It says, but you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are a helper of the fatherless. Look at the screen for a moment. Pull a couple lines out of there for a second. You consider their grief, he's looking at the details, and take it in hand, he's owning the details. When my father died, I was about 40 years old. And even though <laughs> fatherless at 40 years old would seem like no big deal, I kind of felt lost. It was strange it was surprising to me i'm looking to get a new car man i wish i had a father to talk to i'm thinking of quitting ministry cuz i can't stand it and i'm thinking of getting a cdl i wish i had my dad 
because he was a truck driver. I could talk to him about it. I'm wondering, what in the world is wrong with this world? And I wish I could call my dad, talk to him about it. About that time in my life, Laurel's father, my father-in-law, did something that at the time I hardly noticed it, but in retrospect, I see it. He had always treated me like a son, but he stepped up his game about that time in life. He began to talk to me about more serious things, relationships. He bought me breakfast. Hey, Steve, you want to go to breakfast? He introduced me to the folded egg. If you don't take anything else from this sermon, take the folded egg. You go to McDonald's, you get an Egg McMuffin, do you ever eat that egg and say, this thing feels like it's rubber? Ask for the folded egg. It'll change your life. <laughs> no extra charge for that. Jim introduced me to that at breakfast because he would take me to breakfast. He did what a dad of a 40-year-old man might do. He was a father to the fatherless. This is what God does. He looks at the details as he fathers the fatherless. So you want to know how to live this out? Help those with help. Watch God do that and imitate him. You can't help but see how the Father in heaven protects the vulnerable. And, and Jeremiah speaks of this in chapter 22, verse 3. I'll put it on the screen. He says, this is what the Lord says, do what is just and right. There's justice. Re and then he tells how. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who's been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the alien, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. God's commanding them to act with justice. He's telling us to care for the vulnerable, to relieve their trouble, to protect them. You see, it's not just about knowing a Bible verse. It's not just about putting it on a pen and distributing it. It's not just about memorizing a Bible verse. You would think that would make the big difference in your life. But honestly, the difference is in the details. What are you doing with that verse? How are you living that verse out? And you may be wondering, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know where to start with this justice thing. You're not going to believe the next line I'm going to say, you're going to say, could you possibly be any more redundant, Pastor Steve? Here it comes. You begin by looking at the details. You begin by looking at the details. You stop yourself from speaking like, like I have spoken before in, in platitudes. Oh, yes, we must act with justice and fairness and goodness of all kinds toward the fatherless, the widow, the alien. Yeah, you got any details to explain how to do that? Because if you're just saying it, that ain't making it. I was, uh, I saw a news story recently that really got me thinking. The title of the article, it said this, it said, children in PA's child welfare system are sleeping in county offices. Think about that for a minute. Think of the details. A local source told me personally that a worker from the child welfare system had to take a child to a local hotel for the night to protect her and so that she had a warm place to sleep. Someone who works in that system, who's sitting in this congregation, is doing this right now. Think about that for a moment. Think of the details for that child. Think of the details for that worker. And don't just say, wow, they need to do something about that. Huh. What should be done about that? The article I read said this is happening in 45 counties across Pennsylvania. This isn't happening, it probably is, but I'm not talking about another country. I'm talking about here. You know what the... I can't fix that. 
but what can I do? What can I do? Where do you start? You begin by looking at the details. And, and then second, take a look at yourself. I mean, if you were to involve yourself in something like this, what role would you fulfill? Maybe you could pray. Well, Pastor Steve, that's weird that you would say, maybe I can pray. What is that? Why didn't you just say, you could pray? Because not everybody can pray. You know why? Because prayer is a discipline. And you have to choose to make that a priority in your life. I heard one guy say to another recently, I am praying every day for your son. I thought, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. So I said to that guy and another guy, I said, I am praying every day for your son. I find that's a discipline it's hard for me to maintain. I am right at the verge of putting a reminder on my phone to remind me, pray for those two sons, right? You got to have an element of discipline in your life in order to pray. It's not just something you say you'll do. It's something you choose to do. The difference is in the details. Maybe there's a financial need that you can help with. You know, Christian ministries that do this sort of thing, they need money, and it surely is good to give. So maybe you could give. Maybe there's a financial need that God would put on your heart, and you can care for that. When there's an appeal for financial assistance, by all means, give as God tells you to give. Maybe you could volunteer. I mean, don't let writing a check be a cop-out. It's often easier just to give than it is to tend to the details. Hey, here's a check. You, you guys take care of that, would you? I mean, write the check, no question about that, but don't let giving keep you from serving personally. Have you noticed that serving God in any capacity is kind of like getting in the pool? Here's what I mean by that. Some people jump into the deep end right away. That's what I did when I was like 15 years old. Some people step into the water to shallow end just a little bit at a time. That's what I did when I was four years old. And now that I'm 40 plus, I do the same, right? I, I, I would say serving God's that way. Sometimes serving God is that way. Sometimes people jump in and, and that can be kind of dangerous Jesus himself says to consider the cost before building. So do that. And then if it seems reasonable, by all means, build. If you're going to get into the pool to make a difference, let me encourage you to slip into it slowly and prayerfully. Because maybe it's not for you. Maybe it is for you. I can remember the first time I went to visit a missionary on site in their country. I was not there for a day and a half before I looked at him and said, I am not called to do what you are called to do. You always kind of wonder, right? How would I manage if I was on the mission field? I think I could do that. How hard could it be? It took about 36 hours and I'm like, this is just too hard for me, man. I couldn't do this. When I looked at myself, and that's the point we're on, take a look at yourself. I think I messed up my PowerPoint. How did I do that? There we go. When you look at yourself, does this ministry seem to be for you? Because it's good to know when a ministry is for you. And it's good to know when a ministry is not for you. Consider who you are. No matter what, become more aware. Educate yourself. Come next Sunday morning. What time is that next Sunday morning? Ah, oh, it's 10 a.m. Thanks, I forgot, right? Come next Sunday morning, next week. Bobby Johnson from the Keystone Family Alliance will make a short presentation regarding care of children in our county. Bobby is a believer. She speaks with clarity concerning the topic and with honesty. I cannot think of a better opportunity for you and I to become aware of the details when she spoke at the ministerium meeting with the other pastors there, I'm like, wow, I was so clueless. I, I was doing nothing. I wasn't even praying. Something changed. The difference is in the details. So, yeah, 
above all, make yourself aware. It's kind of interesting. In your teen years, you go through a phase where you feel like, I'm going to change the world. We even have a song that sings that. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change the world, right? And we tell kids that. We tell teens that. I, I can remember one time my daughter came home. I think it was from Life, which is a big alliance conference. She came home and she said, Dad, the, the speaker there says that our generation is the one that will change the world. Do you think that's true? What a perceptive little 14-year-old girl, right? She's really thinking about the details. And I said, as much as you want to, it's true. When we're young, we get this idea, yeah, we can change the world. And as we move into adulthood, it doesn't even have to be cynicism. It just becomes an awareness like, wow, that's not happening. I, 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 I can't change the world. And we kind of give up. It is true. You probably can't change the world. But you might be able to change someone else's world. The difference is in the details. I want to pray that you would be looking into the details. Would you stand with me, please? And we unite our hearts together in prayer. <laughs> Let's pray. God, it has been such a pleasure to look into your word this morning. And we are so thankful for the goodness that comes from it. Father, we are so thankful that you looked into the details of our life, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, thank you for doing that. Spirit, we are thankful for the way you unfold details in our hearts and show us right from wrong and good from bad. We are thankful that we don't have to live a life where we're just spouting platitudes, but where we're actually involved in the details of, of bringing abundant life. We ask that your spirit will always lead us and guide us. Our lives would be full and rich with meaning because of Christ Jesus who died for us. Amen.
Amen. I've asked one of our elders, Josh, if he would conclude our time in prayer. Josh? Lord God, we thank you for being in this house today. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have spoken to us directly and you have reminded us of what it is that you expect of us. God, you ask us, you've commanded us at the end of Proverbs that we are to speak up for those who are destitute, those who are voiceless, those who are in need. That we are to do our part to rescue those who are being led away and to not pretend that we don't know what's happening. But we are to rise up, to step up and do our part. And that is to pray, that is to advocate, and that is to accept what it is that you have for us. So God, we humbly now just ask that you would be with us. The enemy would love nothing more than for us to walk out of this church the same as what we were when we showed up. But God, you're not in the business of that. Change us, mold us into your likeness. Have your way. I thank you for this message. And we look forward to what it is that Bobby will have to deliver to us next Saturday, Sunday morning. God, go with us. In your name we pray. Amen.